Absolutely, Julie. Cool. cool. Let me find my. Um, oh, why? Why am I? Ooh. Hang on. Two seconds. I am not having a good technology day today. One moment, please. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, Today, we've got a speaker that needs no introduction, uh, Professor Peter Davis from the Women's Hospital. So before we go on to introducing him and his talk, uh, this is uh, just our title page for our seminar series. Uh, you can um, access the talks and our programs on our school website, WhatsApp groups, which are currently full, um, WeChat, if you guys like WeChat, Telegram, and uh, courtesy of Rahul the Tech Fiend, uh, a Twitter page. So just a few housekeeping um, rules. Don't be insulted if you're muted. It gets pretty uh, chatty in the background. We'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for Peter to answer questions. Um, type your questions on the chat pane, but if you have a real burning question, just raise the hand icon. And Peter has given and permission for us to upload his talk on um, the social media sites as well as our school websites. So we'll post the links afterwards if the Zoom gods allow us to. So without further ado, we'll go on to introducing our speaker. I, I love this shot, it's so glamorous. Um, he is a professor of, um, he's a neonatologist and the director of newborn medicine at the Royal Women's Hospital, um, the lead of multiple, multiple big and very important studies that have uh, directed our newborn care um, for quite a few decades now, Peter. Right. And today we're very privileged to have him speak to us about dexamethasone, one of the most important medications, but also one of the most um, uh, dangerous medications that we have in our armamentorium. So without further ado, um, over to you, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. And uh, we had to quickly get rid of that big picture of me. It was very well, embarrassing. Very embarrassing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But it's, it's wonderful to join you. I, I congratulate you on this, this great idea of, of bringing people together from all over the world. And I'm, I'm just amazed to see uh, the breadth of countries that are on, online today. So, uh, Julie, I've, I've, I've taken the topic and broadened it out a little bit. Um, I thought we might briefly touch on antenatal steroids as well as postnatal steroids, just um, by way of, of demonstrating what good evidence looks like and, and, and to look at some of the uh, interesting current questions about antenatal steroid therapy before we get on to postnatal steroid therapy. And just to remind ourselves uh, that RDS is one of the main reasons we get out of bed as neonatologists every day. It's our bread and butter condition. It affects 15 million babies a year worldwide and a million babies die with this condition. As we all know, the rates of respiratory distress syndrome increase as, as our babies get more immature. Um, most of our, our babies in Australian neonatal intensive care units, the ones that attract our attention are the, the babies under 28 weeks and the, about a half of those uh, will get RDS but maybe more importantly worldwide the babies of a slightly higher gestational age although the rates are, are slightly lower the absolute numbers are higher of babies with rds between 28 and 32 weeks just to to think about uh, steroids and perinatology uh, nice to remind ourselves that um, this was all accidental and uh, this great breakthrough, as, as many scientific breakthroughs, came about accidentally when Montligans, in giving dexamethasone to uh, induce preterm labour in lambs, found that it actually seemed to benefit those lambs and it helped aeration of their lungs. New Zealand took the lead. They did their first randomised trial shortly after that in the early 70s and uh, demonstrated that this might be a useful treatment for um, preterm babies. Of course, with any um, 
positive effect, we have to be on the lookout for negative effects and the potential risks of, of antenatal steroids include stillbirth, so saving the newborn baby, but at the, at the, at the risk of uh, causing the fetus to die. Steroids and their well-known association with infection that could affect either the mother or the baby. A lot of animal work suggesting that uh, steroids are not good for growth, particularly of brain growth. And then there's this uh, theory and in, in, indeed uh, fact that messing around with animals early in life can lead to later uh, diseases in adulthood along the Barker hypothesis line. So steroids seemingly good, but some potential risks that have to be faced. Now, like uh, most important topics, this one's been sub uh, has been looked at by the Cochrane Library, and uh, many of you know that the uh, the logo for the Cochrane Library derives from the antenatal steroid story. So this is what the pooled analysis would have looked like if, had it been done uh, fairly early on in the sequence of events of randomised trials in this topic, showing a clear benefit for antenatal steroids, but the fact that uh, it took so long for this evidence to get out into practice, particularly in North America, was one of the reasons the Cochrane Library um, was formed so that we could look at evidence uh, early, put it together and, and make it clinically usable. So this is what good evidence looks like, I think. This is a the systematic review includes many studies, 30 studies and many subjects, more than 7,000 women and more than 8,000 babies. It's not all about numbers, it's also about the quality of, of studies. One of the main criticisms of uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses that is that you put garbage in, you'll get garbage out. Uh, so it's important that the quality of the, of the studies is reasonable. And in this case, it is. So green indicating uh, a low risk of bias or a good quality study, yellow, un unclear, red's the colour we don't want to see. And in fact, there's very little red in this overall assessment of, of risk of bias for these trials. And you're, you're well aware of the benefits of antenatal steroids when the pooled analysis have, has been done. It prevents neonatal death without increasing the rate of stillbirths. It keeps babies off the ventilator, decreases the, the need for respiratory support, therefore the cost of neonatal intensive care. Has no effect on rates of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, but uh, the effects are not limited to the lung. There seems to be a, a maturing of both the brain, so a reduction in risk of intraventricular hemorrhage and uh, the gut reduction in risk of necrotizing enterocolitis. We have limited uh, data on the effect of antenatal steroids on um, the children as they grow to adulthood. But again, the work of our New Zealand colleagues is reassuring and shows there is, are no differences in the rate of diabetes, no um, problems with growth as measured by height, weight, and head circumference, no problems with hypertension. Uh, the children exposed to steroids uh, achieved uh, educationally as, as well as those not exposed and had normal lung function and bone density. So in summary, the, the story on antenatal steroids, it's a, an effective therapy, well demonstrated, saves babies' lives, does not increase, increase the risk for either the mother or the fetus, keeps babies off ventilators, reduces intraventricular hemorrhage and necrotizing enterocolitis, and seems to be risk-free into adulthood. Now, one of the criticisms of this evidence is that it was acquired in the era before we were seeing babies uh, being actively managed before 25 weeks. And so there was an argument that this evidence did not apply to our 23 and 24 week gestation babies. And, and for us, uh, at least in Australia, that's where the interest is. So the evidence, it's worth having a look at the evidence uh, such as it is, um, and to admit, first of all, that it's much weaker. There are no randomized trials to help us answer this question. So we have to step 
down the pyramid of, um, of evidence to cohort studies and there are eight of those of variable quality. However, the, the evidence is, is again quite convincing that steroids reduce mortality, uh, whether you're looking at, um, at uh, variables of um, weeks of gestation, so 22, 23, 24 weeks, all reduced mortality or overall, which is a, a strong effect. It's a consistent effect and uh, as a result of putting together 10,000 cases. So there is moderate to low quality evidence that exposure to antenatal steroids is associated with re reduced mortality and risk of severe cranial ultrasound abnormalities in neonates born before 25 weeks. The next question that we as neonatologists sometimes get asked about uh, by our obstetric colleagues, uh, when should we give or should we give more antenatal steroids after the initial dose? And there are some very uh, legitimate, real concerns that many babies exposed to steroids do not deliver preterm. So they're, they're not um, likely to benefit from those steroids, but are exposed to the risks, particularly if we're giving more than one course. As I've said, uh, there is animal evidence, particularly from the sheep, that steroids and recurrent steroids impair brain growth and development. And then there are some human observational studies that indicate an association between steroids, particularly repeat doses and developmental problems. Of course, those observational studies are subject to bias, um, confounded by other factors, including threatened preterm labor. So uh, again, we turn to the Cochrane Library uh, to, uh, for some evidence on this question about repeat doses of prenatal steroids. Um, 10 studies, 5,000 babies and, 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 their, and, and their mothers. Good quality evidence. And the, the bottom line is that repeat prenatal steroids reduce the risk of respiratory distress syndrome. That's a statistically significant, clinically important effect. Treat one mother sorry, treat 17 mothers with prenatal steroids to prevent one baby getting respiratory distress syndrome. These authors looked at a combined outcome that they called a serious infant outcome, and that could include death, BPD, intraventricular hemorrhage, necrotizing enterocolitis and retinopathy of prematurity, and found that repeat steroids improved that combined outcome. The downside was that it reduced, they reduced birth weight, but not if adjusted for gestational age. And although the evidence was uh, limited, there was no evidence that uh, babies were disadvantaged in terms of disability into childhood. Carolyn Crowther and her colleagues went one step further. Uh, more recently, last year, they published the results of an individual patient data meta-analysis and found no statistically significant differences in any primary outcome for the child or for the mother. And so those were death or any neurosensory disability for the baby, sepsis for the mother. The they, uh, individual patient meta-analysis confirmed the benefit of a reduced likelihood of needing respiratory support. Did note that the birth weight Z scores were lower in inf infants exposed to repeat prenatal steroids. And their bottom line, their recommendation to clinicians was that we should be providing clinical benefit with the least effect on growth, then the number of repeat treatment courses should be limited to a maximum of three and the total dose of steroids between 24 and 48 milligrams. So that's uh, antenatal steroids and some of the controversies there. Uh, postnatal steroids. So. Postnatal steroids, the evidence uh, is a real, really a mixed bag and the risk and the benefit varies according to the timing of the steroids, the baseline risk and the, the route of administration. And we'll go through those. So if we think first of all about the, the timing, um, Cochrane authors have uh, divided uh, trials on postnatal corticosteroids into early therapy and late therapy and a fairly arbitrary cutoff of before seven days 
defining early therapy. Now, there are many studies, 32 studies, just over 4,000 babies. So you can see these studies uh, on the whole are quite small studies. Nevertheless, the evidence uh, is high, is rated high for most of the important outcomes. The results, the, uh, the pooled analysis of these, of these studies shows no difference in mortality rates and some respiratory or cardiorespiratory benefits in terms of getting babies off a, uh, an endotracheal tube earlier, reduction in the rate of bronchopulmonary dysplasia and a reduction in rate of patent ductus arteriosus. However, the harms were, uh, were quite marked, just gastrointestinal bleeding, intestinal perforation, hyperglycemia, hypertension and growth failure, and perhaps even more concerning uh, the increased risk of long-term neurological harm in the form of cerebral palsy, um, but not de death or the combined outcome of major disability. And the authors noted that the harm was associated with dexamethasone and not hydrocortisone. So the conclusions uh, of, of, the, uh, of the early, uh, early trial meta-analysis was that the benefits of early steroids may not outweigh the risks. More, more long-term data are required and more trials of hydrocortisone powered for long-term outcomes are required. And so in response to this call for more uh, evidence on hydrocortisone, uh, this quite influential study was published uh, in 2016, the PremiLock study, early low dose hydrocortisone and looking at important outcomes, survival without bronchopulmonary dysplasia. This is a, a, a French study and reflects a, a sort of a philosophy that um, our preterm, our extremely preterm babies may be considered steroid deficient and that uh, early hydrocortisone might be considered a physiological replacement therapy. So this was a, a, a methodologically sound study, double blind, randomized at 21 French units, at 21 French uh, intensive care units. It included the babies at, at highest risk, those less than 28 weeks, and the intervention was uh, hydrocortisone at one milligram per kilo for the first seven days, and then half a milligram per kilo for the rest of the three days in the first 10 days of life. Now, unfortunately, this trial stopped early at about two thirds of the way through their planned sample size. And they said the reason for this cessation was financial and technical support limitations. And this was quite unfortunate, particularly since it was on a background of regular um, looking at the results of that trial. Every 100 babies, they would stop and see if there was an effect or not. The results were that um, babies in the, in, the hydrocortisone, in the hydrocortisone group had lower, sorry, had higher rates of survival without bronchopulmonary dysplasia, 60% versus 51%. That's a significant value. Um, however, no differences in rates of death or BPD. Again, we see uh, a benefit of steroids in the form of hydrocortisone that more were extubated by day 10 of life, 60% versus 44%, highly statistically significant. And again, a reduction in PDA, uh, this time expressed as need for PDA ligation. Again, a statistically significant result. Uh, the important, uh, very important outcome of neurodevelopment at two years um, was showed no uh, difference between the hydrocortisone and placebo group. So some units have, have taken this trial and run with it and, and use this. We haven't in, in Melbourne, um, and that's largely because it's a, uh, the treatment effect is modest and it's imprecise from this single trial. 
And we still have lingering concerns about exposing all extremely preterm infants to early systemic corticosteroids. The uh, enthusiasts for this, um, for this treatment have taken it to a individual patient data meta-analysis and uh, the French author, um, along with Christy Waterberg, a leader in the field, and Michelle Schaefer uh, have pooled all of the data using individual patient data to uh, try and shed some more light on this question. The numbers uh, are clearly dominated by the French trial, and we're still less than a thousand babies from five uh, eligible trials. And like many steroid trials, um, problematic because of the relatively high rates of open label corticosteroid use. The positives for low dose hydrocortisone were an increased survival without BPD at 36 weeks, 46% versus 53%, although the, uh, the rates of, the, of those components of the outcome death and BPD were not statistically significantly different. There was a decreased death before discharge and a decreased uh, rate of PDA treatment. However, no differences in days on ventilation, days of CPAP, days of oxygen, and the rate of babies needing home oxygen. On the downside, uh, the, the use of low dose hydrocortisone was associated with an increased risk of uh, spontaneous gastrointestinal perforation and an increased risk of late onset sepsis and no differences in uh, rates of long-term neurodevelopmental impairment. So back to uh, the more mainstream um, analyses and, and looking now at Cochrane's late postnatal corticosteroid uh, review. Again, um, a relatively large number of fairly small trials resulting in uh, a total number of babies enrolled of slightly more than 1,400. Again, the quality of the evidence is rated as high. No difference in rate of death between the groups. A reduction uh, with the use of late postnatal steroids in rates of BPD assessed at 36 weeks less babies going home on oxygen in the steroid exposed group. And the combined outcome of death or BPD, uh, a statistically significant, clinically important reduction in that outcome. Again, this, this idea that uh, the steroids will get the baby off the ventilator, this time by day 14, yes, that, that seems to be the case. And the usual downsides of steroid therapy, a higher rate of hyperglycemia in the steroid group, higher rates of hypertension, and a higher rate of gastrointestinal bleeding, just of marginal statistical significance. The important long-term outcome uh, of cognitive delay, no difference between the uh, steroid and control groups no difference in rates of cerebral palsy in infancy, and overall, no difference in major neurodevelopmental disability. And the combined outcome death or major disability, the uh, point estimate lies almost on the line of, of no effect. So no difference between the two groups. So the conclusions of the, of the Cochrane authors were that the benefits of late steroids may not outweigh the risks. They may reduce mortality without increasing long-term neurodevelopmental risks, but the quality of those studies is limited. And these authors suggest that we reserve late steroids for infants unable to be weaned from mechanical ventilation. If we, if we, if we can do that with the lowest dose and the lowest duration, that would be best. Which brings us to the, the DART trial that, that Julie was uh, keen that we talk about. And just to remind everybody that this, this trial goes back, was reported in 2006 and started in the last century. 
And it, unfortunately, this was a trial that uh, coincided with a major swing of public opinion uh, from fairly liberal use of, of steroids to a time when international bodies were uh, warning about the potential harm of steroid therapy, particularly the risk of cerebral palsy. Um, and so this trial ended much too soon. But just to remind you of the dexamethasone or the DART regime, a 10-day course with a total uh, dexamethasone dose of 0.89 milligrams per kilo, and the ability, um, blinded to knowledge of what the baby got, to give a follow-on course uh, of the same regime after that first 10 days had been completed, and that was given in about a third of babies. Now, how do these babies compare to the babies we're treating today? So just to remind you, there's, we're dealing with only 70 babies, but predominantly inborn. Babies that we're seeing today, so predominantly um, babies in the DART trial were very immature, very small, birth weights in the 650 to 700 gram range, reasonable sprinkling of multiple births, born at a time when we were intubating rather than putting babies on, trying babies on CPAP in the delivery room, very high rates of uh, surfactant usage, relatively uh, late use of steroids into the fourth week of life on average, and babies with quite severe lung disease, babies in around 50% uh, on average oxygen at the time of trial entry. Condition of entry was that the baby was on uh, an endotracheal tube, so sprinkling of babies on high frequency oscillation the rest uh, on intermittent positive pressure, conventional ventilation, and one stray baby who was enrolled in spite of being on nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation. So what was interesting about the DART regime was that this low dose short course of, uh, of dexamethasone was highly successful in getting babies off the ventilator. So the, uh, the dexamethasone babies came off uh, considerably earlier than their control um, peers. So failure to extubate by day 10, almost 90% in the placebo group versus 40% in the dexamethasone uh, group. That's a statistically significant result. The remainder of these results are not statistically significant, but by and large favor the dexamethasone group uh, fewer babies died, slightly lower uh, rates of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, but very high rates, so reflecting uh, quite a, an unwell population at study entry. Um, high rates of home oxygen uh, delivery and reasonably high rates of op open label steroids used after enrolment in the DART trial. Sepsis rates are uh, around 50%, not, not different in the two groups. These babies were followed up. Again, none of these results were statistically significant as you might have predicted from the, uh, from the low numbers recruited, but all um, trends favoring the dexamethasone group, um, less cerebral palsy, less, less death or cerebral palsy, but not statistically significant. So we had to think uh, a, a little bit about why various trials of, of steroids um, produced differing results. And Jack Sinclair, one of our mentors of, of many Australian neonatologists of a certain age, came up with this idea of doing a meta-regression. And the hypothesis here was that perhaps it was the baseline risk for bronchopulmonary dysplasia that determines the treatment effect of the steroids on that combined outcome of death and cerebral palsy that worries everybody so much. So logically, the steroids are more likely to do harm when the risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia is small, or likely to be to do good when the risk of BPD is high. And this is a meta-aggression uh, of the effect of steroids on the combined outcome of death and cerebral palsy versus the rate of BPD in the control group as a measure of the risk of that population for BPD. Easier to explain on a diagram, which we'll come to soon. 
So as part of this uh, study, that we found 20 uh, publications, more than 2,000 babies, nine early treatments, 11 later treatments, and this is what the meta-regression looks like. So on the x-axis, we have the risk of BPD in the control group going from zero up to 80%. So getting higher as we go along the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have the effect on death or cerebral palsy. So zero marks the line of no effect. So no difference between babies exposed to steroids or not exposed to steroids. Trials above that line favour controls, or in other words, indicate that the steroids were doing harm or increasing the rate of death or cerebral palsy. Trials below the line, below the horizontal line, indicate the steroids were doing more good than harm. They were reducing risk of death or cerebral palsy. And so we've got some big trials represented by the big circles and some small trials represented by the small, tri the small circles and the overall effect that shows as the, the result, as the rate of bronchopulmonary dysplasia increases in the population, the benefit from steroids increases such that by the time you get to 50 or 60% risk of BPD, the steroids are doing more good than harm. We repeated that, uh, that analysis uh, a few years later when more trials were available and it, it was remarkably robust. So we're just going to leave the systemic route um, because obviously we're, we're thinking we're doing the risk is of harm to the brain, particularly and perhaps to the gut. Uh, if we could deliver the steroids directly to the lung, get the benefit in the lung without exposing the other organs to the risks of steroids, maybe we'd be better off. And so the idea of uh, using inhaled budesonide uh, came to the fore. This was Dirk Basler's publication in 2018, uh, a reasonable size randomized trial. Again, this high risk group of babies between 23 and 28 weeks, and a good trial in terms of looking at long-term outcome neurodevelopmental disability. And the early outcome that they reported, they reported both uh, in hospital and then outcomes in infancy. So for the outcome of death or BPD, there was a statistically significant reduction in babies exposed to budesonide, their rate of death or BPD falling from 46 to 40%. And this uh, is one of the problems with a composite outcome because the rate of death was actually higher in the budesonide group, not statistically significant, but higher, whereas the rate of BPD was lower. So we had the treatment uh, budesonide affecting one component of the primary outcome in one way and the opposite for the other component. Steroids doing good for BPD but potential harm for death. Their primary outcome, neurodevelopmental disability, no statistically significant difference. But um, for the outcome of death, which was not significant in the in-hospital group by two years, was statistically significant. We've got a p-value of 0 0.04 and a 5% higher rate of death in the budesonide group than the placebo group and no statistically significant difference in that combined outcome of death or disability. So it seems that inhaled steroids are not the solution. So that brings us to uh, a topic dear to my heart. What about if we added steroids to surfactant therapy in, that, in those first hours of life when the inf lung inflammation is just getting going? And Dr. Ye in Taiwan has led this field uh, for the past five or 10 years. He randomized um, 265 uh, VLBW babies mean of 26 weeks, mean weight just under a, a kilo. These were quite unwell babies. These are babies on a ventilator uh, and in more than 50% oxygen quite early on in their course. And his treatment uh, was to combine budesonide with the Savanta and give it as would normally be given as normal surfactant would be given. 
and compared it to standard therapy of Savanta. This was given eight hourly uh, until the oxygen concentration came down below 30%, uh, potentially up to six doses, but most of the babies only received one or two doses. And his results were remarkably, spectacularly uh, good in terms of uh, showing effectiveness. The, the steroid exposed babies had far lower rates of the combined outcome death or BPD, 42% versus 66%. Um, the, the, uh, the main effect was seen in the moderate to severe BPD uh, outcome. These babies exposed to the budesonide had lower oxygen requirements early on, showed no adverse effects. There was a pathway for, um, for benefit in, in that the steroid exposed babies had lower levels of inter interleukins uh, in their tracheal aspirates. And uh, there was some reassurance in terms of long-term follow-up that there were no differences either in um, brain uh, function or somatic growth. So why aren't we all just using this, this treatment yet? Well, we don't quite trust the results, I think. It's uh, not, to, not to suggest that this, this is an important research, but it was a small sample size and a large effect size. It used Savanta, a, a, a surfactant that's not commonly used, at least in our part of the world. It needs a larger volume. Um, the inclusion criteria to get into the trial meant that only the sickest babies were enrolled um, compared to many of our babies who aren't quite that unwell but still have substantial risks of BPD. There was a risk of bias in this study. There was no placebo and there was unclear blinding and there was incomplete long-term follow-up. And so that's what's led us to, uh, to start the the PLUS trial using, um, using Curasurf as our exogenous surfactant uh, and combining it with budesonide. Uh, we are now up to, I think, 280 babies uh, on the way to around 1,000. Uh, if there is a thank you to anybody who's already helping with the trial and anybody who's interested in, in participating, please uh, reach out to us. Now, Julie asked me to, uh, to uh, cover one more topic. Um, and this was, I just uh, taken some snapshot of, snapshots of the email exchange at the, hoping the end is nigh for lockdown. Well, uh, sorry to report that we're still very much restricted to our homes till nine o'clock uh, in the evening. Um, this idea of, or this subgroup of, of babies that are problematic, babies stuck on CPAP or high flow uh, at term or beyond term. And my response was no evidence to guide us. We'll just have to, uh, we'll just have to wing it. And thinking about this question, we know that there are some things that are bad for our graduates, our, our tiny babies uh, that are in our care in neonatal intensive care. One of them is being in hospital. The hospital is not a good environment for babies to, uh, to be in from a developmental point of view. They're much better off being home with their, with their parents. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia is linked um, to poor neurodevelopmental outcome. And we know that being on respiratory support, particularly being on a ventilator uh, at or near term, uh, puts babies in a very high risk um, category. On the other hand, we know that there is a, a direct effect of steroids that does cause harm to the brain. So it's a trade-off between these, uh, these two directions. So it is an evidence-free zone. Um, like all drugs, if we can get away without using uh, something like dexamethasone, we're better off to avoid it. We would very rarely, and, and so we're, we're, we're talking about what, what different places uh, practice. And for, for us, a baby stuck on high flow uh, around the time of, of uh, being due to go home would not, um, would not lead us to
start dexamethasone, we would be um, patient and, and trying to get this baby down onto low flow and then discharged home on low flow oxygen. We certainly would use uh, dexamethasone for a baby who's stuck on an endotracheal tube. Those babies, uh, we, we, we would uh, guess the benefits outweigh the risks and to get these babies off an endotracheal tube uh, at around their due date should be a high priority. And for babies stuck on CPAP, it's, it's, uh, it's a 50-50 bet. We would sometimes use that, particularly for babies getting worse and particularly for, for babies at risk of um, developing respiratory failure severe enough to, uh, to warrant intubation. So that's an unsatisfactory answer. We, we, when, when we used uh, steroids, we would use the lowest dose for the shortest time when all else has failed. So just to, to wrap up and, and hopefully leave time for, for a few questions. Um, the conclusions about antenatal steroids, one of the best investigated treatments in perinatology. They're safe and effective and should be given to all at-risk mothers. Uh, I think the evidence, not perfect, but sufficient to indicate that we should be prescribing liberally uh, for babies for mothers at risk of delivering before 25 weeks gestation. Patricia, uh, Carolyn Crowther and her and her colleagues have, have shown us that recurrent doses of, of antenatal steroids are safe and effective, but have suggested uh, a pragmatic um, limit to those recurrent doses, a maximum of, of three doses and a total dose between 24 and 48 milligrams. For postnatal steroids, Pick the babies who are at highest risk of death or BPD. Um, looking to the future of the newer strategies tested, the combination of surfactant and steroids to us is the most promising. But again, for us, it requires further testing in, in substantial randomised trials before we use it as standard therapy. So I'm going to finish there. And for my Indian friends, I bring you good news uh, of a rare victory um, over the English team at home um, overnight. And uh, we salute Glenn Maxwell, that frust most frustrating of cricketers. And I'll stop there and uh, see if there's any questions. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Peter. I better be careful while I write on emails, right? Yeah. They might, <laughs> they might come up. They might come up. They might be they might be zoomed out. So we've got a couple of questions now, and then we'll invite questions from the floor. Um, the first is from Dr. Uh, Paul Bloomfield. Um, he asked about the risk of uh, benefit or um, long-term outcomes to um, late preterm um, deliveries, thirty-four plus weeks for antenatal steroids. Yeah. Um... That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, and it's, it's one that, that, that still is leading to some variability of practice at, at our place. The, the, the benefits seem to be um, to, there is a, a, a small reduction in the risk of needing to uh, have respiratory support in neonatal intensive care for those, for those late gestation babies. And the trade-off is there's some um, higher rates of of uh, hyperglycemia, also needing needing treatment, and the uncertainty of of, of the long term effects. So uh, I think that's that's a, a question that's that's still um, there's room for individual um, weighing up. I don't think the evidence is is strong enough to to come down uh, hard in either direction. So a lot of work needs to be done for the older um, older gestations at risk of preterm delivery. Yeah, I'd be interested to know from Paul what, what he does in his practice. Paul, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, I'm a general paediatrician in regional New South Wales, and the practice is variable in my experience as well. Um, I guess the obstetricians that I work with are fairly liberal in their use of antenatal steroids, and it's reassuring to hear that at least in the more preterm infants, there's not evidence for repeat dosing causing adverse outcomes. But um, I, where 
it was perhaps when you suggested that the um, the group that you're treating has a low risk for the outcome that you're trying to prevent, that's when the problems with adverse outcomes become more troubling. And I think that late preterm is where the big question mark is for me. Yeah, I, I think that's right. It's it's a small it's a small benefit for a uh, a relatively small subset of the exposed group. So you really want to be very confident that you're not um, laying down a harmful pathway for those who would, were never going to benefit from from the steroids. Thank you. You're muted. You're mute, Julie. Ah. Zoom. Oh, my God. So Dr. Stan from Singapore has got a couple of questions for you, Peter. Um, so the first one is, uh, is there a place for using systemic steroids in babies less than 27 weeks um, stuck on uh, NIMV and oxygen more than 30% during the second week? So the older babies who are stuck on um, nasal IMV. And then the second question he has was, how many courses of DEX can you use for babies with BPD who are stuck on the ventilator after a month or so? So all the babies, I guess. Yeah. Hello, Sam. It's nice to, I can't see you, but it's nice to hear your questions. I can hear your voice coming through those questions. Hello, my friend. Um, okay, is there a place for using systemic steroids, babies who haven't been intubated but are, are needing a fair bit of non-invasive support. I guess that's the that's the question, Sam. Is that right? Uh, some babies, you know, are, you know, on NIPPV, you know, say beyond two weeks of age, yeah. of 30 to 40 percent. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a question we, we struggle with and we we don't have a, a uniform policy on on that um it, it's 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 an interesting question isn't it and and for some babies where you think um we're we're starting the steroids to prevent the baby being intubated and therefore prevent the the downstream effects of of, of those steroids we we might just try that that's a relatively new um, position. In the past, we've taken a fairly hardline position that the, the babies enrolled in the DART uh, study were all intubated and so the benefits really only applied to them. We've, we've sort of extended that down a little bit to, um, to include babies who are at very high risk of needing, needing to be intubated and that we can, uh, by starting the steroids, we can keep them off the ventilator. But we don't do that with a huge amount of uh, confidence, and certainly not not arrogance. I am aware that there are some some uh, some hospitals in, in New South Wales that are much more aggressive than us, and 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 seem to have good results um, for for their babies for for starting babies on CPAP who have got prolonged uh, oxygen requirements. So it's a it, it's another sort of evidence free zone, and I, I don't think any of us can be too dogmatic about that. Um, how many courses of BPD? So that just to, to, to remind everybody that, that, that the DART trial looked at um, up to two rounds of, of, of the DART regime. In practical terms, for us, uh, we, we do recognise babies who are steroid sensitive, um, who respond well to steroids, but then who rebound after we, they come off the, the steroids and either need re-intubation or um, are unable to wean from the ventilation. So for, for those babies, we will try and pick the dose, the lowest dose to which they were controlled and a, a tier of the DART regime, it might be tier three uh, or tier four, that had them under control and put them on that uh, on that dose for a week and see if if we can make some headway. Uh, I have to be completely honest with you. We haven't uh, completely abandoned the Cummings regime, and there would be one or two babies uh, every year where the babies were steroid sensitive, but the DART regime just wasn't doing it for them. That we would resort to the Cummings forty two day regime, but that is. Uh, that is a, um, uh, a tough decision to make, one we would make in conjunction with the parents and usually would involve uh, a team, team decision. OK, 
Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, a question from um, Dr. Che in, uh, I'm not sure where you're from, um, but this is a question dear to our heart. It's the use of um, MDIs for bupedesonide fluticasones on treating established BPD. Yeah, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have any experience using that. Uh, I, my impression of the evidence is that there's, there's not a lot of evidence that, that those uh, multi-dose inhalers uh, work for, for babies on, on BPD, but uh, I, I'm, I'm agnostic on, on that. It's not something we've, we've used. I'm sorry. Did you have some experience, Julie, that you could share with us? That, that's a major discussion point in our unit at the moment. The respiratory physicians love of um, uh, inhaled steroids um, yeah. for the kids that are stuck on CPAP or high flow. And, uh, you know, some of them seem to get better, some of them don't, um, you know, it's a hit and miss. Yeah. Um, that, it, it, again, it's, a, it's an area, we, it's a, ba a group of babies that we recognize that frustrate us. Uh, and, um, yep, steroid uh, inhaled steroids are, are certainly worth I think testing, but really should be tested in a, in a proper randomized trial to, to answer that question. Could I ask, uh, is, is Srini online? Could I ask him to say something about this? Are you there, Srini? Oh, he's, he's not there. He was there. Anyway, he's also passionate about that. Uh, Srini, you are online. No. Okay. We'll move on to the next question then. I will come back to that if he gets online. Hi. Hi, um, Goody. Yes. Yes. Hi, yes. Trini. Thank you. Uh, hi, Peter. <laughs> G'day, Trini. Uh, I was actually about to send you an email about this uh, before this teleconference, but didn't get a chance to send you this email. Um, I, we have been speaking to, I don't know where, I just had to duck out to the NICU for five minutes. So I didn't know where the discussion, I think you were uh, answering the questions by Sam. Um, so we have got ANMF, as you know, Australasian Neonatal Medicines Formulary, and we have done a dexamethasone, hydrocortisone based on a Premilog study. And we have been in touch with uh, Lex. Is there any data on it? There, there isn't uh, that I'm aware of, Srini. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I, I was just saying before, before you came online that there are some babies that we uh, we run two rounds of the DART regime and find that towards the end of the the the, um, the, the weaning phase, these babies rebound and threaten to need to go back onto the ventilator. So we will extend our course of, of, of steroids a week at a time for whatever tier keeps them stable and then and then wean down. But uh, always the principle is um, as low a dose as you need and stop it as soon as you can. Um, so once we feel like we've got um, an idea of where a particular baby sits in terms of its steroid responsiveness and it the, the minimum dose that that we can get away with then we will we'll try that and, and then wean uh, over a period of weeks rather than a period of days but that's that's just uh, our local response there's no evidence to uh, back that up I'm afraid thanks Peter it sounds like you might have to do another study Peter on antenatal steroids beyond um, the Weeks, there's um, a couple of questions about what's the role of antenatal steroids in um, the early term births, uh, planned seizures, you know, things like that. Yeah, well, it, it gets back to, I think it was Paul, Paul's point. These are babies that are at, at, at fairly low risk 
of um, usually uh, a mild disease. You know, worst case scenario, these babies come out, um, develop some respiratory distress, requires CPAP. Very occasionally, they need they need intubation and surfactant therapy, but it's only a, a tiny fraction of all of the babies that you're giving steroids to that could possibly benefit from it. Now, there will be some babies, and we're, we're all aware of them, that, that go on and develop pulmonary hypertension and become very unwell, having had a cesarean section of 36 and a half weeks. But to try and prophylax against that happening, you're, you're treating a lot of babies and exposing them to the risk of, of steroids. So that's why I'm suggesting that we think carefully before we give steroids to those, those late gestation babies. Um, there are some uh, specific cases. Uh, a, a mother has had a, a baby, a previous baby, or a series of babies who have all developed respiratory distress syndrome after a late preterm or, or early term delivery. That might be a, a, a reasonable amount, a reasonable case for treating that mother with, with uh, antenatal steroids in, in subsequent um, pregnancies because those babies are at higher risk of, of running into trouble. But uh, it's, it's, it's not a straightforward equation, I'm afraid. Okay, so if you don't mind, we round up with a, a couple of questions again on um, inhaled steroids. It seems to be a hot topic. Um, uh, Marnie, our fellow, says, um, what's, what was the reason for the increased mortality in the inhaled steroids? And a comment from Lynn Down from the PN says that um, she loves inhaled bidesonite in UPN and ICU. They've been using it very um, uh, satisfactorily now without any evidence of increased mortality or other side effects. Could you comment on that? Um, so with respect to Marnie's question, uh, I, I don't have data and I, I, I don't think that there was data uh, published in, in the in that trial about the cause of mortality. I think there was no specific cause. I, I don't think it was adrenal crisis in, in those babies. I just think it was uh, a general increase in, uh, in, in mortality. Um, perhaps sepsis might have played a role, but I, I, I don't think we, we have a, a reason. But the, the result um, was statistically significant. So that's, uh, I think that's, that's turned many people off but obviously not Lynn um, and, and that's that's fine we, we all see um, we all interpret the evidence um, based on our own experience and our own patient group so different people can see the evidence and apply it differently in, in, in different settings so I wouldn't argue with Lynn but for us um, we uh, we think that um, the evidence of benefit was not sufficient for us to start uh, there, the, the potential benefit for adding steroids to the surfactant, um, albeit the, the suspicions that we have about the A series of trials, means that that's probably the one, the route that's most worthy of, of uh, large trial um, investigation. Okay, um, I think that might be it. Uh, Srini started writing a high Peter note, but then he had to run off. Um, okay, so we could talk for like three, three days or something on steroids or three years probably. And lots of research to be done, I guess. Uh, lots of open unanswered questions that are very important to us uh, nowadays. Babies living longer, it's getting stuck in our NICUs longer, stuck on the you know, high flow, CPAP, whatever. So yeah, um, thank you so much again, Peter, uh, for this fantastic talk. Um, and uh, hopefully you can come out of lockdown very soon and we can meet up somewhere in person. We can go shopping together, Julie. Yeah, okay, you lead the way, I'll use your card. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Thank, thank you so you. much, Peter. Well, we'll close it now. And uh, the talk will be posted as soon as it's download, um, converted by Zoom on our site. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.